Hello, and welcome to the Evening Tea. This is Tim, and in tonight's episode, we will listen to a short clip from an interview that Dotson conducted with Samuel L. Jackson. I hope you enjoy. At the Beverly Wilshire Hotel in Los Angeles on Wednesday, December 1st, 2004. The interview is being taken by Dotson Raider, D-O-T-S-O-N, R-A-D-E-R. It is about 3.30 p.m. Uh, this is an interview with Samuel L. Jackson, whose new movie is Coach Carter. When you left, when you're done with high school, why did you go to Morehouse? And Morehouse is a terrific, but it's a tough school. Why did you go there? Um, because my mom filled out the application, and that's what she said. And I actually had a scholarship to UCLA. Um, and I was going to come out here and stay with my aunt and go to UCLA. Um, I had actually qualified for the Naval Academy. Uh, that's right. I know, in a funny way, you and I kind of, you know, I knew that that whole honor system and the regimentation of things there was not going to work for me. Right. So I gave up that whole thing and let another kid who was close to look up. When you said about, uh, what, 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 interesting to Morehouse, about Morehouse. Well, it was close okay. to but, Chattanooga. But it, it, the school you picked, mm -hmm. you chose it. Willie Nelly, you happened to be there at the exact moment history was there. Mm -hmm. That's what's extraordinary about it, is that, I mean, I look at your life, and, and it, you know, if he'd gone somewhere else, instead of like going this way, it would have gone that way. It just, he, I mean, I don't know. Two things I'd like you to respond to. One is the number of things I'd like you to respond to. Uh -huh. You said you never got crazy until you hit college. All right. right. I, I want to know why that was. Freedom. Um, I didn't have to go home every night. I didn't have to answer to them anymore. Um, I was kind of on my own. Uh, so I did all the things that I didn't do in high school. I didn't get drunk and, you know, fall out. And I didn't, you know, have a lot of girlfriends. I didn't stay up all night. I didn't do any of those things. So I did all those things when I got to Morehouse because I could. I was in a dormitory with a lot of guys who were doing those things. You know, we played drinking games. We drank all the time. We played cards all night long, but I still went to class. Sounds like Columbia. <laughs> yeah, but I still went to class. Right. Um, I still did my work. I still maintained, you know, a three-point average. But one of your interviews, you, two things I wanted to talk about is that, is that while you were there in 68, but to me in my, in my uh, in college with the over two, overwhelming events, so far more than the killing of John mm -hmm. Kennedy, was the death of Martin King and the death of Bob Kennedy. Those right. two things were just, I mean, the whole world turned upside down to, to, for me. Mm -hmm. And I, for, I just, I mean, it literally changed my, the way I saw the world. And uh, and you actually were there when the when his funeral was there. Yeah, I actually That's worked when he the was funeral. brought back home. Yeah, I actually was, worked the funeral. I, I went to Spelman, because he was in Sister's Chapel to be viewed. So we went and viewed him in Sister's Chapel. That night, some people came through the dorm and wanted to know if anybody wanted to go to Memphis to march. And um, we all went down to the church the next day, got on the bus, took us to the airport. We got on a plane and flew to Memphis, a, a, a plane that Bill Cosby and Robert Colt had oh, paid for, because okay. they were actually on the plane. So we flew to Memphis, marched in the I Am a Man right. garbage thing, and then flew back to New York. Right. Yeah, flew back to, to How did that affect you? How did that affect Didn't affect you at all? It, it, you see, for me, interesting sort of thing. Um, I've watched Dr. King speak a lot, and I'd seen him have debates with people like Stokely Carmichael when I was in that, you know, radical faction. You were snick? Yeah, I was in the radical faction. Um, and I was angry about it, but I wasn't shocked by it. Um, and I didn't want to go out and burn the community down because of it, because I knew that wasn't going to you know, help us in any way. Yeah. Um, and I didn't participate in that. Um, but I knew that the change was going to take something different. 
Um, and I became more involved in the radical aspect of it, you know, than the peaceful coexistence or going to sit mm -hmm. in or doing all those other things. I really thought, I really believed for a while that it was going to come to armed struggle. Um, I did too. Enough, I did too. I thought yeah. we were, I thought we're on the verge of a revolution. I thought it was about to happen. Um, and I was kind of preparing myself for that more than anything else. Um, so it kind of turned my head in that direction in terms of where do I want to live. So I started looking at the world yeah. in another kind of way. Right. And what country do I want to go to yeah. if this happens, you know. And I was involved in some, you know, pretty radical stuff. So at one point in 69, after we locked the, the trustees in this building and let them go finally, that summer I spent down in Atlanta working in a, a children's facility that was pretty much run by SNCC and Rap Brown and some other guys. Oh, you bet me you know Rap Brown? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I spent time with all those guys. Um, and we were stealing people's credit cards and buying guns because we were getting ready for this whole yeah. revolution. Yeah, I thought it was coming through. Yeah. And um, one day my mom showed up and she told me to come and go to lunch with her. And my best friend's mom was with him. Is this in Atlanta? Yeah, down in Atlanta from Chattanooga. We got in the car with him ostensibly to go to lunch. And they drove us straight to Chattanooga to an airport. And my mom put me on a plane for here to L.A. to yeah. come and stay with her brother. And Alan flew somewhere else. And she said, do not get off that plane. Do not stop anywhere. Do not go back to Atlanta. And she was like, no. Like, what the hell happened? So when I finally got here, I called back home and said, so what happened? Uh, just the FBI had been to the house, told her that if she didn't get me out of Atlanta, there's a very good possibility I was going to be dead before the year was over. And you know, she just kind of freaked. So that was that. So I came out here, and I stayed here for a year and a half. She kind of sued Morehouse and was threatening to sue him to get me back in school. They let me back in. So threatening Morehouse and let you back in? Yeah. I wish she had been my mother. I never got back in. <laughs> I just want to tell you something. This is uh, uh, it's not the, to, I mean, to the point of why we're here to talk, but at Columbia, we hit, when we t we t when we took over the, we took over the buildings twice. We took over the police, but a terrible, terrible police attack. And about a week later, we took over them again. Mm -hmm. them. And it started because the Columbia was going to build in Monify Park in Harlem. It was mm -hmm. going to take about nine acres of, of land. It's the only one of the few real parks in Harlem for okay. a gymnasium that people in the community were not going to be allowed to use. Exactly. All right, now you know all that. Yeah. But the point is, one of the great, I went like that when it happened, is that when the first building taken over was Hamilton Hall, mm -hmm. and which is a classroom building, and it was taken over by black and white students. Yeah. The second day, the black students threw all the white, all of us out. Mm -hmm. And they did, I mean, that was the first time I was aware on in, in personal way of the, how radicalized, we then went on, I mean, out of this group of students at SDS at Columbia, mm -hmm. the next year in 69 was your year, we, we ended up in Chicago at the last SDS yeah, convention, the, the Weathermen were born. And yeah. so those guys that, that was the, I didn't take that turn, they mm -hmm. did, and, and some of them died, and they ended up terrorists, and all sorts of yeah. things. So all I'm trying to say is, I understand, not, only do, not only do I understand what you're telling me, as I admire what you're telling me. Mm -hmm. um, I look at I have a good, good sense of myself and where my, that that anger, which was it just suddenly I had no idea it, why, but suddenly it, it was there. Right. And I've look I've written books about this and I look back on that and I and I just was wondering where do you think that rage that anger in you I don't know where it came from in there where do you think it came from in you what caused it because you've had it for a long time in your life, you probably still do. But where did that rage come from? Well, my my probably came from the fact that I I had grown up suppressed. I couldn't express a lot of things that made me angry because they would have gotten me killed. Okay. So be, when being be, be, be black, right? Okay. Just because I was in a segregated society, right? So okay. there were a lot of things that I was just not allowed to say, even even at home. They would say, you cannot think like that because you'll leave here and you'll get killed. So you just had it. And all of a sudden, 
I was in a place where I didn't have to do that anymore. Um, to the point where <laughs> when I came home the first year after being in Morehouse, because now, in 1966, September 66, when I went to college, there were guys coming into my class who had been to Vietnam. So there were these older guys who were like 20 years old, who were freshmen, who had big afros and they had these big black rope fists around their neck. And we were running up and down the halls at night screaming and they were actually trying to study because they want a GI Bill and they would like yell at us and you motherfuckers are going to get killed. You don't realize what you're doing. You need to study because if you don't, you're going to fuck out and they're going to send you to a war. And we're going, what war? What the hell are you talking about? Vietnam. I just came back from Vietnam. People are dying over there. Your brothers, brothers everybody's dying in Vietnam. So we're like, right. You've been to Vietnam. Well, okay, fine. We pull out maps. Not on any map that we could see. No such, you know, Vietnam, what? Not there. Because it was Indochina or whatever it was. But, so we're telling him, he's crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah, so now about four of them. So, that very same year, I have a cousin that I had grown up with in Georgia, who was the same age, got killed in Vietnam. All of a sudden for me, it's like, boom, very real. real. Wait a minute. He got killed where? These fools were saying he got killed in Vietnam. Yeah, he was walking and he got shot. And he got... Oh, my God. So then I started finding out about the war that it was going on. This is before, you know, everybody started going, you know. And I had a draft number. We had to register. We had to register. And then I got a lottery number. My lottery number is like 15. So now I'm like, oh, hell no. So I'm totally part of the anti-war movement now. You know, my cousin's dead. I got a high draft number. Oh, hell no, I'm not going, you know. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Evening Tea. On our next episode, we will return to our exploration of Norman Mailer. Bye now.